Too wonderful. Welcome to the service this evening. Amen. Welcome those who are watching by Facebook and YouTube and then those, those of us here in the auditorium. Carrie's going to start us off with some songs, so we're ready to roll. Uh, grab a songbook, go ahead and stand with us, and we'll go. Amen. We all, are you all glad to be in the house of the Lord this evening? Amen. Go ahead and take your songbooks. Turn to 605 with me. Stand up with me. We're going to do just the chorus on this song. We're not going to do the verses, but I do want to do just the chorus on this. It starts out, oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. How many of y'all heard this song? Got a few of you? Okay, well, maybe we'll learn it together tonight. It's a great song. Just, just to be happy in Jesus that you're a Christian. Amen. Let's try it, Miss Amy. Now that you've sung it through, how many of y'all think you know it now? You should know it because you just sang it, okay? All right, so we're going to try it again. Let's try it one more time. We'll get it in our heads tonight. You ready? Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified for I like this song so much, I kind of want to do it one more time. Let's try it again. Here we go. Ready? Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, just in my forever reconciled. Amen. Great scene. Turn over to 614 with me. 614, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's try to sing this song out loud for the Lord. Here we go. Ready? I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord with my mouth. time. Are you guys glad to be here tonight? Amen. I, I don't know about you, but I am ready to sing, all right? Let's try it again. Here we go. Ready? I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord with my so much for singing. You may be seated. Amen. Well, it's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Come to fellowship together and hear God's word and to sing the songs of praising the Lord. Amen. Uh, just a couple of things to keep us on the same page together. Uh, the total, we announced at the very end after the service was over, I kind of got back on the microphone. Brother Daniel, I tell you what, He's going to come. He's got an announcement he needs to make about FBI and then tell us the total. We still know the total, what the total of the tracks were. Now, we're going to continue to pass the tracks out, right? We're going to have put those trees on all the different doors throughout the building, and the more petals we fill up, 
is 50 tracks per pedal, and we'll get the place filled up with giving out the gospel, okay? Daniel, come on. All right, good evening, everybody. How are you all doing? Hey, has anyone handed out a track today? Hey, one person did. Two, three, okay, there we go. Thank you so much. Spreading the gospel, all right. Someone over there? Awesome, wonderful. You will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. You know what happens when you sing? Well, you're not whispering, right? You're saying something loudly. Other people can hear you. It's great to use that same approach when you're witnessing. Okay, don't try to whisper to someone when you're witnessing. They won't be able to understand or hear you. So, track totals. 2,150 tracks so far is what's been handed out by the church, and that's in a month's time. We're still going to progress. We're still going to move forward. All right, I don't have a sheet out there right now, so y'all forgive me, but I'll have one out there for Sunday morning. Keep your track totals uh, going, and we're going to incentivize it a little bit. Okay? We're going to incentivize. If you get over, uh, I'm going to call it 50 tracks in a month, and then the total may change depending on the month. We're going to put you in for either a drawing or, or give you a little uh, something, whatever we think of. I don't know. Make it interesting. But we're not going to tell you about it. We're going to let you just kind of expect a surprise. Handout tracks, not just to get a prize from the church, but you're wanting to get rewards in heaven because you have helped someone see the light and someone see how good those mercies are. So... That is my shameless pitch on our tracks and track month. I do have a couple notes on FBI, our current Faith Bible Institute students. Don't forget this is early enrollment or early re-enrollment period. We still don't have new enrollment period available right now, but this is early re-enrollment. If you want the early discount, do so before April 30th if you are a current student. Now, we've been waiting for electives for a long time. And we finally scheduled it on elective. This right here is a flyer for our elective for Faith Bible Institute. We have one sitting on a table out here, um, out this door, directly on that table. And it is personal evangelism. Okay, it is not a full-blown semester. It is a elective. Okay, so you wonder, what is an elective? Well, you can ask any college person what an elective is. Some people might say it's a useless class, but this is just... Uh, an addition to your Bible training already. This is not useless. All right? This class right here will help you become a better soul winner, and that's what this is all about, personal evangelism. So when does this class start? This class starts June 7th, and there are three nights. We do it Monday, 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 so June 7th, June 14th, and June 21st. And we're going to keep the times the same as regular FBI because we're going to be done with the semester. So 6.30 each of those Mondays, we're going to go for two hours each of those Monday nights. So 6.30 to 8.30 on the 7th, 14th, and 21st. Now, there is a cost. There's a cost for any college-level class, but this is significantly lower than the rest of your Faith Bible Institute tuition. It is $40 for, a, uh, for your first primary student, and then $30, remember, get that household discount, right? So $30 for each additional student in the same household. 40, 30 for six hours of training. And what this will do is it'll tell you how to use gospel tracks. It'll tell you how to witness. It'll have you practice. It'll have you get out. There is going to be a test. I just want to uh, prepare you right now. This is not the current John Yates that we are used to seeing. This film was filmed in 2000. So he might look a little bit different as far as being John Yates of 20 years ago. Some of the things that you will get, I already told you about those, how to use gospel tracks. Um, and then there is a deadline to enroll. I need a check from you along with one of these completed applications by Mother's Day Sunday. That is the last time you can give me one because that next Monday it's going in the mail. Unless you want to pay a late fee for it, and then we can do that. It's kind of like enrolling for regular FBI. But Mother's Day Sunday, one of these applications along with a check for you or however many in your household and then we'll send it off all together as one, uh, as one payment. And these are over on the table where the bulletins are. So, yes. You know what? Make it out to the church. Make your uh, personal check out to the church, and then I think we can cut a church check 
to FBI. So yeah, make that check out to Central Baptist Church. Uh, you can put a note on it, say personal evangelism or elective or FBI, and we'll know what that um, we'll know what that means. All right. Yes. Yes, so that's a good question. This is open enrollment. You don't have to be an FBI student. Anyone can enroll in this elective, FBI student or non-FBI student, so the prices are the same uh, all around. So $40 for your one primary student and then $30 for each additional member of your household that wants to take it. Um, doesn't matter if you're a student or not a student. You can go ahead and you can sign up. So how old do you have to be? 14 years of age and finishing ninth grade and up. That's the minimum age, 14 years and finishing ninth grade. You do not have to be enrolled in our FBI, but we need at least eight people to actually run this class. So if I can have eight people sign up, then we can make this class a go. And it'll be like old school FBI like we did when we first started here. We'll have the DVDs, have the paper that gets passed around, have the paper test at the end of it. Um, yes, one more point before I go. I only have so many of these applications, so if you are seriously wanting to do this, then please take one. But these applications are not for you to just take and think about it. If you want to do it, then go ahead and take it, because what you see up there is however many I have. All right. So if you want it, yes? Well, we will if we have to, but I want someone to, this is, this is a tool. I just want to tell you this. This is a tool. We have a lot of tools here at church. All right? we, we arm and equip you as Christians to go out into the world and combat the devil and witness to folks. So this is another tool for you to do this. How, how much better of a soul winner do you want to be? How much better of a witness do you want to be? This is why we do these things. This is why we offer all this. How well do you want to use your sword? So, you know, can we Xerox it? Yes, I would love to, but... Yeah, but we have like 25 of these. Yeah, so if we have 25 students, then praise God. That's going to be great. But um, I only want you to grab these if you are seriously thinking about taking the class. Okay, just know it's out there, and we're going to tell you again on Sunday uh, for everyone else that's not here. Anyone have any other questions? No questions? Wonderful. All right. We will see you all later. Carrie's going to be preaching to us tonight in just a few minutes. Take a look at your uh, prayer list tonight, and if there's folks that you didn't get on there beforehand, also keep in mind, don't forget the uh, prayer list is out there on Sundays too. So I saw that several had already put their prayer re uh, request on there, and that's good. Do you have anybody tonight you'd like to add or something you just want to praise the Lord about tonight to add to the list? Anybody? Yes, Mary. It's notice, folks, it's already gone to the back of the sheet, too, okay? Okay, Sherry. Let's pray for Sherry. Her granddaughter has headaches. Keep praying, if you would, to pray for her. I tell you, uh, when we go to prayer tonight, Brother Rick, would you be, mind being our guy of praying at the end of our prayer time? Okay. And then who else? Anybody else? Okay, I think everybody got it on the list. Amen. Well, that's good. Praise the Lord for that, and that gives us more time to pray. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, Carrie is asking a prayer request for Owen from the Marines. Okay, let's pray for Owen. Okay. And Zach, too, right? Yes, sir. And Zach. Okay. All right. I put on there about us praying for the missions conference. Let's go begin now even praying for that, too. Okay, get your Bibles out.
And Carrie's going to come and preach nine and a half minutes to us, okay? See, can you? Oh, wow. Yes, I think you can hear me. Um, amen. Did you guys have a great day today? I had a good day. Um, got really blessed. Got to go and do some shopping today, which is one of my least favorite things to do. Um, but there was a special reason for it. We have, our, we have a giant skit that we do for summer camp every year. And so I did some, Amy went with me, and we did some skit supply shopping. So we had a little bit of fun today. Um, I don't know why I told you that. But anyway, um, we're going to go on to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to be looking in verse 20 to start out with. There's a little bit more scripture than I usually read to, to start out the message, um, but I really believe God would have us to, to read this tonight. Um, let's start it with a word of prayer, though. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace and uh, for bringing us here together. Lord, I pray that your name would be glorified through all of this. God, I need you very much at this time, and Lord, I believe our church needs you very much at this time. And would you just grow spiritually in you and in Christ and your word, Lord. We love you. Holy Spirit, would you, would you fill us, God? Um, I give myself completely to you by your grace. And I pray that if someone's here tonight that's not saved, God, I pray that you'd save their souls. And uh, Lord, just help us to be encouraged in you and in your word. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 20. We're going to go ahead and start reading. The Bible says, And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight. And shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and ran into the army, and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Goth, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And get this verse, And Eliab his, his eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that, the mighty, uh, that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, and this is where we're going to be at tonight, but we're going to keep on reading after this verse. But verse 29, our text, And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And verse 30 says, And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard from David, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go, uh, go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by, the beard, by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and the uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. And we're going to be ending with this verse. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with, thee, with me. I'm going to be talking to you about this one simple phrase in verse 29. I know you've probably heard messages over and over again on this. Um, I love it. It it's never gets old whenever I read it. The Bible says in verse 29, And David said, What have I now done? What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? 
And so that's what I'm going to be preaching to you about tonight very, very shortly. So stay with me. We're talking about David's up against Goliath. And we know about all the different preachers and messages that you hear about how David goes up against him. And we have these giants in our lives that are like Goliath. And the only way that we will take them down is if the Lord has full control, which is absolutely true. But I want you to know tonight, there is a cause for why we take down the giants. There is a cause for why we reach someone with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you a question tonight. Is there a cause in your own life? The definition of the word cause, a principle, an aim, or movement that because of a deep commitment, one is prepared to defend or advocate. I noticed this. I was preaching to, some, uh, to the teenagers on Saturday. Matter of fact, Abigail got to come over um, and a few of the other girls that came over. My sister came over and we just had a blast. It was about close to 20, or 30 teenagers that were there. I told you already about this on, Saturday, or on Sunday, but God just worked tremendously. And I preached, on to them, or preached to them on the last message about stepping out into eternity. Stepping out into eternity. And what might happen or what will happen when you step out into eternity. You're going to either end up in one of two places. That's either heaven or hell. And so I went in through this and I started giving them some t- statistics that we were going over and how people are literally stepping out into eternity every single second that we, have, we are talking right now. I, I wrote down these statistics. I've told you these before, but I just want to remind you. Over 151,600 people. Notice, not 151 people, not 600 people, but 151,600 people die on average each day. That blows my mind. Is there not a cause? Let me ask you that. Is there not a cause? Nearly two people die every single second. Ladies and gentlemen, as I'm speaking to you right now, as I'm snapping my finger, there are people going out into a place called eternity. And that is either in a place called heaven or a place called hell. One is to spend eternity with Jesus Christ and one is to spend eternity without Jesus Christ. I pray that no one in here has ever rejected God or is still rejecting God to where they do not want to be with him forever. But that's not what I, exactly what I'm going to be preaching to you about right now. But I just want you to get that, that backstory in your head, in your heart tonight. The realization that people are literally dying every single moment. And what is the question? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? I'd ask you tonight, is there not a cause? We live in a world today where suicide is literally the second leading cause of death for young people ages 15 15 to 24 all across the world. It is a real thing. And I believe in COVID, it's gotten even worse. It's gotten to the point where there are people, every single youth activity that I go to, I feel like there is someone who is struggling with this. And it is not something that we believe should be normal. It is not something biblically that should be normal. But I'm going to tell you right now, it is normal in our society to those around us. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? I'd like you to turn with me just really quickly to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 8 through 12. While you're getting there, I'm going to go ahead and read for sake of time. The Bible says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. This is Paul speaking. But be thou partaker, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Get that first phrase. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That one part of the verse, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And I believe Paul answers that right here with that first verse. The end of the verse says, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the, say it out loud with me, gospel. I believe that's our cause tonight. I believe that with all my heart. The people that are dying every single second, they don't know their cause. We know their cause. And therefore, 
It ought to cause us to bring the gospel to them. I've got one point basically tonight, and that's this. Is there not a cause? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not our agenda. It's not our purpose of what we think our purpose is. It's not our own plans. It's not what uh, we decide every single day. I remember I read in a book one time about a preacher who surrendered his life to the ministry and who surrendered not only to the ministry, but at a point in his life where he'd been preaching several years, he'd been sharing the gospel several years, but he got to the point where he realized, even though he was preaching, even though he was soul winning and doing everything that a preacher ought to do, he realized he did not have the fullness of the Holy Spirit in his life. And I'm going to tell you right now, without the fullness of God in you, that is worthless. And I'm going to tell you right now, with the fullness of God, you can bring that cause to someone who's dying and on their way to hell. I want you to realize tonight, it is not of us, but it is of God. That preacher, he said, I got to the point where I surrendered to myself to the Holy Spirit. And when I did that, I told God, I said, God, it's no longer about when I get up in the morning of my activity, of my agenda. But now it is Christ activity and Christ, his plan and his purpose for our lives. When you get up in the morning, is it your plan? Do you have a busy schedule that's your schedule or is it God's schedule? Is your cause lined up with the gospel of Jesus Christ tonight? The gospel answers all problems that no man could ever answer. The gospel overflows what no amount of money could ever fill. The gospel gives infinite power to a Christian who is of finite understanding. The gospel is the cause that we are to bring to this world. Number one, there's a gospel, which is our cause. And number two, I'm going to end with this. The gospel brings commitment. The gospel brings commitment. This is a very simple message tonight. You've probably already known this stuff, but I believe this is something that God would, he reminded me with. And I believe it's something maybe he could remind you tonight with. The fact, is there not a cause? I believe absolutely, biblically, there is a cause. And his name is Jesus Christ. There is a cause, and it's the gospel. And tonight, we are to go forth with those tracts that we hand out month by month, day by day. Our cause, our cause is to share Jesus Christ with everyone around us. I'd ask you tonight, is there not a cause? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something tonight. Carter, would you help me out? Come on, come on up here, up front with me real quick. I'm going to end with this, Okay. I'm going to do a little, little bit of an illustration. You come right here in the middle, okay? Everyone wants to see you here. Look at this amazing shirt. Don't you just want a shirt like this? This just looks amazing. Um, I know your mom and dad are very proud of you, okay? Um, now, we, we're going we're gonna to do something real quick here. This is very short, very simple, Carter. But I'm going to ask you a question. I'm, I'm going to say, is there not a cause? Now, we talked about that cause being the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to say, Carter, you've told me by your own testimony that you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. All right? But there are people all across this world. Matter of fact, that if you actually look up statistics, about half of the population on earth right now, as we speak, half of them have not even heard a clear-cut presentation of the gospel. I'm going to ask you tonight, let's just pretend that Carter is not saved, okay? I'm not saying that he isn't, but let's just pretend for this moment that Carter is not saved. If Carter is not saved, I'm going to say, Carter, why why, why should I take the gospel to you? Is, Is there really a cause that I should bring this to you? Now, we've talked about the fact that people are dying on their way to hell and they're going out into eternity and they do not know Jesus Christ. And we've talked about how this is our our cause right here, right here, nothing else, right here, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So look at it this way. Carter is a lost man on his way to spend eternity without Jesus Christ. I have the cause. I have the answer right here. If I do not bring this answer to Carter, what's going to happen? It's very simple. He's going to have that one question come to his mind. Is there a God? And I wonder who's going to tell him. We have the reason. We have the answer. 
And he's the reason why I'm bringing this answer to him. I'd ask you tonight, is there not a cause? Carter, thank you so much. You can be seated. I was a young lady that we did recruiting down at Pensacola University, um, or Pensacola Christian College, this past year. And she came up to me, and she, one of her friends had worked with us this past summer, and she said, Carrie, you must, I was telling her about the camp and everything, and I get kind of passionate when I talk about the camp. Um, she said, Carrie, you must really love that place. And you know, when I answered her that, that moment, I said, I do. I believe this is where God's called me to be. But I thought about it later, and I started thinking about this last night. There's a greater reason why I'm at the Edge Christian Camp. And it's for the souls that walk onto that property. We just talked about Carter being our reason. I'm telling you right now, there's plenty of reasons walking all across this world right now. We have the answer. Is there not a cause? I'd ask you to think about that tonight. It's the gospel. We need to bring it to them. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the the grace and the, the wonderful word of God that you brought to us. Lord, how you shared your word with us and how you, you loved us so much that you died for us, God. Lord, you thought that we were reason enough to share your own son with us. God, I believe there's a cause with all my heart and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's your word. I pray that you'd help us to share your word with every single person that we could possibly share it with tonight. And as we go out of here, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to remember there is a cause. I love you, Lord, and I pray that you would just work in a mighty way through my dad's, uh, through his preaching, Lord. I pray that you preach through him, and Lord, I pray that you'd be glorified tonight. We love you, and I thank you. You're so good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's bring our prayer sheet out. So the song, and I think they've got a special they're going to be doing in just a few minutes. So let's look at our prayer sheet, and then Brother Rick's going to come. And we will pray, and then after that we'll do an offering, and the carrier will come back with a song. Okay. What we're going to do is invite you to come to pray at the altar, or you can pray at your seat, and however you feel led. We'll do that for two, three minutes, and then Brother Rick's going to come and close us in prayer and praying for these requests tonight. Okay?
Well, here he comes. Let's do our offering at this time. Let's don't forget to pray for these folks throughout the week now, okay? And we have a new prayer list out there on Sunday. They are depending on our prayers, and uh, let's keep praying for them, all right? Be praying about the missions conference, too, as you, as you think about that, okay? As the guys are coming at this time. Okay. All right. Brother Dave, if you'd lead us, please. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this house, Lord. And please be with our pastors and, and the men that are bringing through the word, Lord. Use this offering towards your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Anyone know the name of that song? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There you go. Very, very good song. I, I know it, it's very simple, but I, I love that song. It's a great one. Turn to 615 with me. 615, stand up with me. I will sing the wondrous story. Everyone get a hymn book, all right? I want, we gotta, we got to wake up a little bit. Y'all fall asleep on me, all right? Take your hymn book, and I want everyone to get one and wave it nice and high up in the air, okay? I want to see you wave it up in the air. There you go. Miss Jessie's got it over here. All right. Anyone else? There we go. We're almost there. Everyone's got a hymn book. We're going to sing this out loud for the Lord. I will sing the wondrous story. Why don't you sing this with me? 615. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Amen. Good seeing you. May be seated. Ask me why I believe like I do, why I'm so convinced that the Bible is true. I'm here to tell you it's only because I've come through enough to see what it does. 
Faith sees the invisible, believes the impossible, receives the incredible, no matter what was. Faith moves the unmovable, proves the unprovable, for anyone willing to trust. Believe and you'll see what faith does. There's a mountain that stands in your way From all you can see, it will be there to stay God said with the faith of a small mustard seed That mountain will move, believe and you'll see Faith sees the invisible, believes the impossible Receives the incredible, no matter what was Faith moves the unmovable, proves the unprovable for anyone willing to trust. Believe and you'll see what faith does. Faith sees the invisible, believes the impossible, receives the incredible, no matter what was. Faith moves the unmovable, proves the unprovable for anyone willing to trust. Believe and you'll see what faith does. Believe and you'll see what faith does. Amen. 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 Have faith in God. What is wrong? Uh, don't turn there. We're going to go to a different text tonight. We're going over to Psalms 100 in just a moment. Psalm 100. But faith does and sees the impossible and knows that God can and God will. <clears throat> when, he gets, when he gets done near the end of Hebrews 11, when it talks about Moses and Abraham and all the other ones, about their faith in the Lord, it says, But what shall I more say? For the time would fail... Oh, no. There you go. How about that now, Ray? Uh, turn this one off, and we're on with just the remote. Uh, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy." It goes on and lists even a lot more. And he's all having obtained a good report through faith. Receive not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Who is that one provided? Jesus. The very next verse of the 12th chapter says, Wherefore, because of these things, in chapter 11, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, it goes on, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. Amen. Amen. The Word of God is so wonderful, and it really is. Psalm 100, let's go over there tonight. We're talking about prayer protocols, approaching the Lord, and how do you approach God in your prayer time? I want to give you one tonight that to want to give you some reasons on why we do what we do around here, and then hopefully ask you to incorporate this prayer protocol in your life. Okay, uh, look at verse, uh, Psalm 100, verse number 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. gladness. Yeah, don't you, don't you think God wants to see His children happy when they're serving? Amen. Well, there's two of you. Okay. God wants to see us happy while we're serving. Just like you tell your kids to do something and they're serving, they're doing something, they're obeying. Do they do it with a good spirit and a good attitude? And God says, I want you to do it with the right spirit, a glad spirit. 
Come before His presence. And this is one of the ways that we can do this. Come before His presence with singing. Have you ever gone to the Lord and started your devotions off or started your time of prayer off singing to the Lord? I'm going to go over a few thoughts here tonight. The reason we start off our church services is this verse right here with song. Come before His presence with singing. I'm thankful for songs, that's for sure. The word singing here in this verse conveys the idea of shouting for joy. Now sometimes when we sing in church, it doesn't sound like we're shouting for joy, does it? It's not like we're moaning for relief. <laughs> I know the rest, uh, if you're having to hear it, you know. It literally means to sound the glad voice of triumph. God says that men are to approach Him with singing. A glad song. A song of shouting. Uh, he wants us to come with, to Him with rejoicing, with a spirit of rejoicing in our songs. Uh, with a celebration, if you please. Shouts of praise. I mean, you got a book here. 150 chapters in one big book of the Psalms. It's the song book of the Old Testament. If God wrote that, had that many psalms written, I think He has a greater emphasis on songs than we really place. That we ought to put more of an emphasis on. And what kind of songs, you know? The entire book is written, the Old Testament's loaded with 150 psalms or songs. One of them states in Psalm 95 too, Let us make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. So when you sing unto the Lord with the psalms, let us make it with a joyful noise. It does matter to God in your approaching Him, in, in your prayer, in your life, approaching God. It does matter to Him how you approach Him. And do you do it when you sing? Do you come to God, before God with a song that is, you can rejoice at Him, or rejoice with Him, and shouts of praise? Let us make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. The, word, the phrase joyful noise there literally means to split the ears. To split the ears or shout for joy. Byron Fox told me some time ago, he said, Brother John, we need to have more singing in our services. Come before His presence with singing. You know, Brother Byron has done all kind of special music. Most of you in this room have bought some of the CDs and tapes from all the music ministry that Byron does. But Byron will tell you again and again, the number one thing of singing in a church ought to be the congregation singing. That's right. Carrie mentioned about being filled with the Spirit of God. The reason I preach a lot about walking with God and, and, and fellowshipping with God it's because I know if you'll do that, and the Spirit of God has, where He has free reign in your heart, and He fills your heart, I know you cannot help but come to the church services with the fire of God in your soul. Right. And not just lean on the preacher or the Sunday school teacher to get you fired up about living for Christ. Right. Amen. If we go about singing to the Lord, I'm not going to ask to raise the hands tonight, but uh, you're riding down the road. Some of you got some gospel songs you play on your CD, you know, maybe back at the house, or maybe you listen to Christian radio. We got a guy coming in the missions conference that represents a fantastic radio ministry that's worldwide, and I'm I'm looking forward to Brother Miller being with us and his family. Um, maybe you listen to songs and and you let those songs they touch your heart. And as you listen to those songs, you wind up starting singing with them. And after a while, you know, you may turn it into a prayer as you're riding down the road. Lord, I just sang about your mercy and your grace. I just want to thank and praise you. Connect your presence with God's presence by singing. Come before His presence with singing. Hmm. Shout for joy. Let us make a joyful noise unto the Lord with psalms. Um, most of our shouting in, in our churches today uh, happen in a business meeting. Think about it. And that's sad. 
I remember when I got saved back in the 70s here in the Tidewater area over in Chesapeake. Churches, churches, the, the song leader didn't have to pump up the congregation to, to sing. There was a difference then. It was an attitude of, man, they'd been time with, they had time with the Lord before they got there. People would fill up the church pews. They would lay their Bibles from Sunday morning to Sunday night on the church pew to make sure they had a seat Sunday night. Some of you older folks like me, you shaking your head, yes, you know, you've seen that. Now, I can tell you one of the main reasons, this isn't part of the message, but I can tell you one of the main reasons why that's not so today. And I'm going to tell you another, in that reason, I'm going to tell you why there's not as much revival today. Not to say there can't be a revival, because God can send revival and has sent revival in the darkest of hours. But God's people are distracted. I'm gone from preaching to meddling now. God's people are distracted with things that aren't necessarily bad things for us, they can become bad things for us. For, for example, whether it's a, a computer or a TV or a cell phone or all those other things, some things can be used for good. It's a tool. But if we, we stay on those things constantly and fill our minds with things that are not necessarily, maybe not bad, maybe we're not watching things we ought not to watch, but, but maybe those things are distracting us and keeping us away from our time with God. So when the preacher gets up and he mentions about come before his presence with singing, why that when I don't even come before his presence? I felt led to say that tonight. I'm being a little hard, but it's with a purpose. We need to understand that God desires, longs for, died for our fellowship to be with him. And God desires our joy as we come before his presence. So much so that if you were to sing so loudly, have you ever, again, don't raise your hand, but have you ever, have you ever gotten by yourself? I don't care if it's in the shower <laughs> or in the car or, or wherever it may be. I come in here at times, I'll get up, I'll stand behind the pulpit and I'll pull out a songbook and I'll start singing songs to the Lord. Hold on a second. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts, right? For, for grace, it's about grace in your hearts in that scripture passage. All right? If God has saved you and God has given you grace in saving your, your and my wretched soul and given us a home in heaven, that ought to cause us to have some joy in our hearts to want to sing to Him. And again, it shouldn't be Brother Al's job or my job or Carrie or Brother Daniel or anybody else to lead singing to try to, to pump us up, to get us to want to sing. It all come naturally from the grace of God in the heart and the filling of the Holy Spirit. The verse there that says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right before that, it says we are to be filled with the Spirit. One of the key... Um, Descriptions of a person who is filled with the Spirit of God is going to be a song on their heart, from their heart, and on their lips to Him. You can't have, if you've spent time with Jesus and the Spirit of God is filling your life, and you're asking for that filling and to see this, and you're yielding your will to God's will, man, enjoy your walk with the Lord. Enjoy. This verse come before His presence with singing. That's not just for coming to the congregation Amen. to come before His presence to sing. If we will get along with God and we'll come before His presence with singing, it'll lead to a better prayer life. It'll lead to a richer devotional reading of God's Word. And we will be able to enjoy our walk with God. It then becomes real. If you love somebody, if you love somebody, you, you want to talk to them, right? Um, okay, if you love the Lord, you want to talk to Him. If you, want to, if you love the Lord, you want to sing to Him and sing about Him. All right, what's the difference? 
What's the difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? I've mentioned a little bit about this before. I, I'm going to sing just a phrase or two of a, of a song in our song book, and you tell me it's not going to be a psalm, but it is going to be either a hymn or a uh, spiritual song. You ready? Here we go. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Boy, wouldn't it be neat to have a song that was from heaven when the angels wrote it? <laughs> yeah. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. What kind of song is that? Is it a hymn or a spiritual song? Take a, just take a stab at it. Spiritual song, some say spiritual song, some say a hymn. All right. The difference between a, a hymn and a spiritual song. A spiritual song is a song that's sung about God to each other, to lift our admiration of God, and it ought to draw us closer to God and cause us to worship. A hymn is a song that is sung directly to God. All right, maybe try that one again. Uh, and then you tell me which one it is, a hymn or a spiritual song. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Hymn or spiritual song? It's a hymn. Why? He's talking to God. Come before his presence with singing. I've said it many times and I'll say it again. If I had to start my Christian life uh, all over again, I would have bought myself a hymn book to go right alongside of my Bible. I'm not elevating the song book above the Word of God. But most of the things that are done in the song book are written based on the premises of the Scriptures. And it will help draw your heart to the Lord. And we miss out on a lot of that. How about this one? Um, hold on. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His power and His love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days. Look at that two little three phrases. You got more doctrine than just those three little phrases and you got anything else. What does that do to you? When you start thinking about what you're singing... A pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of His people. Okay. What kind of song was that? Hymn or spiritual song? Spiritual song. Why? It's singing about God and who He is. And it encourages us to draw our attention to Him. Come before His presence with singing. Both songs, both types of songs are good of what God tells us to do. Speaking to yourselves. You ever go around speaking songs to yourself? Uh, okay, preacher, you're going off the rocker there. People think I'm talking to myself. Yeah, it's when you start answering yourself is when they start asking questions. Don't worry about it. How about this one? Oh, I love this one. Im immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Hymn or spiritual song? It's a hymn. Come before his presence with singing. I, th I, I think the Lord enjoys both, you know. It prepares our heart. Why do we have music in our church? Is it just something, you know, it's a filler? Is what we're doing, is this some type of a filler? No. Is it just to uh, sh show off people's voices? No. No. It shouldn't be. Is it some type of an entertainment? No. Oh, it's coming before His presence with singing. I thought this was pretty good. I've heard it said that God has given us three things to refresh 
the soul. Oh, this, this little point right here is worth writing down, I guarantee you. Three things that refresh your soul, believer. Number one, nature does. That's why people leave from here and go down to Outer Banks of North Carolina and go to the beach. That's why people leave from here and go up to the mountains and go skiing and everything else. They see the nature and what God has created. It refreshes the soul. Even West Virginia. Amen? Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful country. Amen to that. Yes, amen to that. We go because it refreshes our soul. Nature, God has created to help refresh our soul. Number two, friendship. Godly friendship. Fellowship refreshes the soul. I'd like to dwell there for a while. I, Daniel and I have been visiting some of our seniors. And it's like they don't want to stop talking. You know why? Because they haven't been able to have fellowship. And they want to talk and talk. And man, we love listening to them. And you try to get a word in sometimes. Sometimes they'll let you do it, but they just want to talk. They want the friendship. They want the fellowship. A godly friend is worth his weight in gold. Or her weight in gold. It refreshes your soul. And then thirdly, music. God created music. The biggest book in the Bible, as we said again, is about music. Come before His presence with singing. We ought to be doing that. Um, friendship means a lot. I'm not going to get into all that tonight, but I just wanted to give you a few thoughts here. David, playing his heart. God used it to refresh the heart of Saul, even when Saul was trying to kill him. You know, music is, is very powerful. And I'm talking about godly Christian music. I'm not talking about music that's of the world. Um, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace. And I believe that's the key in your hearts to the Lord. God does not want just stale, I got to do this, hope I get over this, hope I don't die while I'm doing this. Singing. God wants heartfelt, a heart filled with grace. Never get over your soul salvation. That heart filled with grace, that God's grace in your life. You dwell on it, and you, those songs here are all about that. You know? And you, it will cause you to want to sing to and worship God. Come before His presence for singing. The spirit of the music. The person leading, you know, it is important who we lead. Brother Al has a heart for God. Uh, Carrie, Brother Daniel, these are men that, that uh, love the Lord. They're having a heart for God. Um, it, have you ever been in a place? I got, I got about 10 minutes. Just bear with me because this is very, very important, okay? I feel very strongly about this because music is not just something that we just do, as I said. Have you ever been in a place, maybe you went to a church, you went to a revival somewhere, or, or maybe you were in a church that revival took place. Have you ever noticed the difference in the attitude and in the singing of the people after that spirit of revival? Just the God, just the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God through the preaching of the Word of God. We're not elevating songs above the preaching. But we are trying to say that the Spirit of God taking the Word of God speaks to the heart, and, and revival takes place in a person's heart. There's something different about that. Have you ever been in a congregation where the people are revived and they just lift their voice to heaven? Um, I love to go to fellowship meetings. We're going to have, host the Tidewater Baptist Fellowship Meeting on the last Friday of this month during our missions conference. And uh, if you're interested in coming to that, please, please let us know. We'd love to have you come. Um, but you get in a room full of preachers whose hearts have been touching heaven and they're faithful at touching heaven. I'm not saying they're perfect. But you get in a room full of preachers and you start hearing them singing. It's like inviting heaven to come down. 
Remember, he inhabits the praises of his people. You want, you want to get God's attention in your prayer life? Start singing to him about him. Oh, oh what is that one? I don't know if I'm going to be able to look it up. I didn't write it down. Hmm. It's lost, lost my point. That's what happens. Don't get old. It just happens. Okay? God appointed men to, to, God appointed singers and those who minister us in special music. And in the singing of the congregation, uh, spirit-filled people. Can you imagine what this place would be like in singing if God's people came in filled with the Spirit? Can you imagine a lost person coming in here and hearing God's people singing with the filling of the Spirit of God in their life? Praising the Lord and worshiping God in song and coming before His presence with singing because at home they've come before His presence with singing and their devotions? You want to see more people get saved? Maybe one of the reasons that lost people, maybe when they come, they don't get saved. Could it be? They see that God has not really made a difference on the, in the heart and in the face of the ones that are here. I'm not saying we're all like that. I'm, I'm trying to say that sometimes if the grace of God has done so much in your heart and your life, and the Spirit of God is filling your heart and life, and you're in tune with Him, and the Word of God is precious to you, and you're reading it and studying it and memorizing it, Maybe that's one of the ways God uses His testimony to sinners. When I got saved, ladies and gentlemen, there was a young man. He didn't have the best of voice. He was four years older than me. I was 14. He was 18. But all over him was God's presence, God's spirit. I mean, if we sang in the congregation, he's going to sing. Wasn't the best voice, but he sang. Do you know through his, through his just being the witness he was, to me I got saved? I actually saw a genuine smile on the face. Wow. God wants us to sing. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You know, as we lead singing, guys are in here and Brother Daniel in the back, you know, we ought to lead it with like we are enjoying God and enjoying His songs. Music cannot replace preaching, we understand that. But it, from the devotions of our hearts, it prepares our heart to pray and to read the Word of God. If we have any type of musical ability, we can play and sing to the Lord even in our devotions. We think it's only just for church services. And we start listening to the songs of Zion, God will use that in our hearts. little refresher. God wants us to approach Him with rejoicing and shouts of praise in our song. Music has the capacity to liberate and revitalize the soul. I didn't get into that too much, but I, I think I hit a little bit of that. The pastor I worked under in North Carolina, Larry Carter, got saved one night because he heard the song, When He Reached Down His Hand For Me. Larry Carter knew he was a sinner. Larry Carter lived right next to the church. That was, before, that was before air conditioning. The big giant windows of the old church were open. Larry Carter, on Sunday morning, his aunt would invite him to come to the church. She was saved. She loved the Lord. Her husband was saved. There's faithful in the church house. He happened to rent a house right next to the church. Larry Carter, despite his aunt would work on his cars on Sunday morning right during the service to spite the pastor and to spite the church. Finally, one day, Larry Carter gave in to his aunt's pleas to come to church. And the old time preaching went out. And God was dealing with Larry Carter. And some guy, one guy, stood up and sang the words, When he reached down his hand for me, Larry Carter ran to the altar. This was a man in his 30s. And got saved. Mm. 
Again, I'm not trying to take the place of preaching. Get songs that will cause you to sing in your heart and use them when you go before the Lord. And when you come to church, transfer what's in that heart and come and together let us rejoice and come before His presence with singing. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank You for song. Thank You for the songs You've given us in the book of Psalms. Thank You, dear Father, for the hymns and the spiritual songs. Lord, I know if we could just dwell more on those songs to bring us into your presence, Lord, we would enjoy our time with you more. We would enjoy reading your word more, and our fellowship would be sweeter with you. God, forgive us for showing a face to the public that, Lord, doesn't honor you with the honor you deserve. Oh, worship the King. Help us, O oh God, to do so and to do it rightly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.